Hi there, and welcome to this podcast episode. I'm Lisa Atkins, and dear friends, Francesca Pick and Susan Basterfield are with me. Hey there, great to be here again. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Susan's in an airport. We might hear uh, some boarding announcements in the back as we go, that little snippet of one there. Hey, so this, uh, this episode is about making the implicit explicit. Let me just say it again. Making the implicit explicit and ways we do that and why we do it. And um, as always, we're gonna be bringing forward ways that we with, with Inside Greater Than um, have practices and beliefs and philosophies around this. And we wanna make it super practical as well. So you're gonna be hearing some stories and um, some practices that you can do. So let's just like start in the conversation of like, what does this even mean to make something implicit, explicit and why would you do it? Yeah, I think that when I'm when I'm first um, saying this out loud to somebody that I've never said this to to before, um, an example that I like to use is um, how social norms just become like the water we swim in, and unfortunately, um, sometimes uh, that means that we can that I can waste a lot of time making up stories about, about why somebody is doing something that I didn't expect them to do. Um, and that's merely because we just haven't taken the time to make the implicit explicit. Uh, example that I like to use is um, I was in circle once uh, with a group of people, quite a few people that I didn't know yet. And I could not believe that somebody was on their phone. I, I could not believe that in this in this special place of you know being together that somebody had the audacity to have their phone in a circle, and I could just feel the anger and tension rising in my body, and I was not able to be present at all in that moment or in the whole um, part of the part of the dialogue that we were having, and I eventually just had to say something. It was like, and and I know I didn't say it as kindly as normally I like to be. And they just said, oh, I said, what? I, 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 you know, something along the lines is like, is what's so important that you can't, you know, not be on your phone? And they said, I'm taking notes. And I just couldn't believe it, right? I couldn't believe how um, easy it was for me to jump from that, like, what is she doing to, I can't believe she's doing that to how dare she do that and how rude and how disrespectful and, and it was simple as you know she preferred to take notes on her phone so that's one example of making the implicit explicit there's heaps more what about you Fran like when you're talking about it for the first time how how do you describe what it what it means for you yeah I guess I was just thinking about how I find this often actually comes up in the context of change. So if a group of people want to change something that you need to first write down, like make explicit, how are we doing things now? Because unless you have that like on paper or somehow in a way that everyone can look at it together, it seems impossible to change it because it's still in this sort of like intangible space. So it seems like an essential step to like, yeah, improving how things work or being able to address things um, so that you, it's like really about creating a shared understanding, right? Or almost like checking that shared understanding. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't I can't tell you how many times in my old life, in my old corporate life, I would be encouraging my teams and the organizations to write down what's happening when it's good because almost always you go back to trying to fix things um, when they go bad. And I think that it's really, it's really proven true for, for me. And I think in greater than as well, that harvesting, writing down things that we're doing as we're doing it can uh, whole, create artifacts in perpetuity so that we can see actually how we got to where we are, where we are now. So we can do exactly as you said, Fran, know where we're starting from when we sense that something um, is ripe for shifting or changing. 
Yeah. And I think also, I guess, just to sort of close on that thought that this usually comes up a lot when new people enter a group, I find. And of course, if you're coming in as an external person, especially you don't know anything, but that uh, if people have very high context, have been together for a long time, there's not a lot of new people coming in regularly. I think then they probably have a lot of stuff that's implicit that they're not even aware of. And maybe it's going super well, right? But um, when new people come in, they usually ask a bunch of questions that then suddenly make you realize, oh my God, there's all this stuff that is like just in the culture and how we just do, how we do things here, right? That's often what people I think refer to. And so that usually really challenges the group to then put more words to what's actually happening and help others come in. Yeah, I, th I think those pivotal moments are uh, sort of like shock the system a little bit when someone comes in and they, and all of a sudden you realize something that you took for granted, like, oh, everyone knows that. No, that's not true. Not everyone knows it. And maybe it's, maybe it's stable enough that it's time to write it down and make it easier for the next, you know, person that enters. And, um, but maybe it's ephemeral. I mean, so that's, that's the, the thing that I'm aware of when I work with people even just the words implicit, explicit, or like people are like, what? What, what, what exactly do you mean? Like what kinds of things are implicit? And I'll say, so like, you know, all the patterns you all have for communicating with each other, those are mostly implicit. You know, all the, your, your competencies in conflict and in change and in communication and in creativity and in collaboration in most groups, all, all of that stuff is completely implicit. They're like, well, that, yeah, we just collaborate. That's just what we do. But there are so many better ways to, ways to better the level of collaboration or conflict navigation or whatever when those patterns can be made more explicit. And I think someone said like more, more tangible. Like they're not, they, don't come, they don't get created completely tangibly, but they can be more palpable or you know, out of the realm of the totally ethereal at least. Yeah, I mean, we might. It reminds me of what we were talking about just before we um, went live here. That uh, in in our in our last conversation, uh, maybe even though it wasn't made explicit, that what emerged was that the conversation was more hub and spoke. So I was acting more as the moderator and inviting uh, the two of you in um, at at certain moments, and because we'd reflected that and we'd made that explicit in retrospect um, when we were debriefing that session, it was easy for us then to make explicit in this session, okay, we don't want to repeat that pattern. No. Um, we're going to try something else. Whereas probably nobody, I, I don't know, maybe nobody even noticed that. And if we hadn't been paying attention, we probably wouldn't have noticed it either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I still think this is probably pretty, um, hard to grasp this this notion that we're talking about so far and i wonder if we can give people some ideas of like what it sounds like and 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 maybe we could i we could replay i'm just now realizing the little part of the conversation we just had that had us move away from the hub and spoke thing so everyone what happened was i i arrived sick and i've been holding the very lightly holding like the, in general, what's the journey of this episode? How's it, you know, what's the main content points? And we were all contributing to that, but I created it into sort of like a beginning, middle and end. Um, although not very well, because when, because when we talked about it, Fran was like, yeah, I can't really tell what the arc of this thing is. So, you know, that's, that's, that just saying what's true is what allowed us to see uh, what was implicit. So we were sort of implicitly holding that someone yeah, knows the beginning, middle, and end of how this goes. Someone's going to guide us through it, one of us. And I show up sick and say, hey, someone else needs to take that role. And Susan's like, well, do we need that role? Because last time it was a little like, I am kind of hub and spokey. It's not exactly what we want. And we're like, yeah, hey, you're right. Let's not do that. So that's what it sounds like. Yeah, I'm also just trying to think of what another like category of that example could be. Um, I guess one that's very basic, maybe it's a bit boring, but it's like about communication protocols, right? So like if you have different types of communication tools that you might be using in a team, 
usually there's maybe certain types of communications that are supposed to happen in one place and then certain in another, right? You might be using Slack. You might also have a WhatsApp group or something like that. A lot of companies have those. And so there's usually a lot of informal rules about what kind of things are supposed to go where. And uh, yeah, basically the, the term communication protocol, the idea of that is basically to write down like, okay, this tool we use for this kind of stuff and this tool we use for another. And so, um, yeah, I think there's like examples of those kind of dynamics all over the place. Yeah, and they and they actually emerge and get get more. I think they get more precise and more explicit as time goes on. For example, like I know um, one project that I'm working on with Elena, uh, where we had kind of this light agreement that um, because we can't all be in the client meetings at the same time, that every time we had a client meeting, we'd um, leave a voice note or some kind of a, a report back on that, and I initially thought it was more like a nice to have um, until she came back and said, no, no, it's actually really important to me to keep um, context that um, we do do this every time. And for me, I think that that is a way that even things that are made explicit <laughs> can be made more explicit um, as, 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 time, as time goes on or as the need um, becomes clearer. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about what happens if you don't make those communication mm. protocols explicit. Um, and I have certainly been worked with groups before where, where they have no agreements about what gets communicated where. People use a variety of things. Uh, people write, you know, dissertations in Slack. And, um, and people can't keep up with it. Starts, stuff starts falling through the cracks. And, and really most people don't think, oh, well, maybe we should just tighten up how we're using these tools and what we're doing, what we're using them for and you know, what kind of things get communicated where it doesn't really dawn on most people. And so that's, I think that's, you know, Fran, you said it's sort of like a mundane situation, but I think it's so common that it might actually be a light bulb for someone listening right now, you know? Yeah. And we literally actually just did this with a, with a client of ours. Like it was like a refactor of all of their channels in their sort of Slack tool and basically helped them like, yeah, reset up, like what types of channels do we need? Do we have different categories? And like, what are some basic rules around how we use them? And because a really common one I think is about like announcements versus um, like conversation back and forth. And that can have a really different dynamic. And I think that like, uh, it can feel quite uh, frustrating if there's so much noise in a ch channel that when you have a really important message, it's a bit the boys cry as wolf situation. Like you have no way of getting it out there anymore because there's just so much chit chatter all over. So I think that can actually be quite uh, detrimental. And so it is really something that's like such a quick win. And to just, yeah, have a conversation about what do we, what do we need in terms of some basic rules and then go from there. I think that's another great example of something that evolves, right? Like you start, um, no, but I think nobody starts intending to have 172 Slack channels, right? But it just, it just, it just kind of happens. And no one in their um, right mind starts that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and having the discernment to say, okay, wait, stop, you know, this isn't this you know we we really do need to think about this mm -hmm. and i think about you know another way of of making the implicit explicit through agreements i've i've sort of changed my mind a little bit about the right time to do that um but it, even but i do still really feel that like hygiene type things when you're getting a, a project together or a new team together to make those uh, explicit at the beginning are really, really useful. Even things like uh, we agree to respond to messages within 24 hours, or uh, we agree that if we are not going to make a meeting that we will um, send a note and let people know. <laughs> Again, yeah. these are things that, mm -hmm. that we don't really necessarily think about, but I had just find so super helpful, like two or three or five things that we can just tick, tick, tick at the beginning of a project or when we're coming together with a, a different configuration of people. 
Yeah, I was also just thinking about like, I think it's important to highlight like a pitfall of this, like the other side of too much of making the implicit explicit, which is the sort of like over designing, like writing down everything in extreme detail or like doing it too early and then getting quite like bureaucratic and, and rigid. And actually it's something that I've seen quite a bit in the Web3 space, funnily. Also, because I think uh, in Web3, like there's a lot of work that's async. Most of it is written communication. And I think somehow um, because it's such an anonymous space, often people are trying to design processes and policies and things that don't say like, oh, go to Joe Blow and ask him and he'll explain it to you. But it's like, follow these five steps. So yeah, I think um, like it's really like not at all trivial to find the right moment to make the right amount explicit. And because otherwise you could end up drowning in like way too much documentation and then it becomes useless as well. So I think it's just really important to keep that in mind. I'm also, th I'm also thinking that most work teams are just busy doing their work. Like they're not paying attention to the fact that their Slack channels have gotten out of control or that I mean, they might be suffering from it, but they're not necessarily noticing that, you know, or that, um, or that we have this 10 step process for something that really needs to be a conversation, you know? Um, and I think that when people uh, increase their level of awareness and self-management, that that becomes more common, that we can see those patterns that we're actually in. And I, that's one of the reasons I love working with people at Greater Than, because you know, most everyone's got a second track running in their head, which is a pattern level or a meta level track of what the heck is going on, not just the content we're working on, but how we're doing it and what are our patterns. But I think, I think it's like the, you were saying, Fran, about helping that client with their Slack channels, you know, I'll bet that you brought a really useful perspective that they didn't see, you know, maybe next time they will see it now knowing that something that was like the water we were swimming in can be um, more useful, palpable, and, you know, uh, a thing, a, an object. And that's it. It's something you're subject to becoming an object, which is like the hallmark of adult development. That's how adult development happens. And so like, this is very related to that. Mm, absolutely. Ah, I never thought about that. I, and again, like the, I, I, that w <laughs> the pitfall is, really interesting too because i think like you were saying Fran, that in web3 i felt we need one of the whole assumptions is that if you if you um make unambiguous rules for everything then the people and the subjective interpretation um becomes less important and it doesn't really matter because the facts should take care of themselves the other the other client that we're working at with at the minute that um is absolutely obsessed with finding the perfect tool that has everything, right? That includes, you know, video and capability for town hall and direct messaging and can be done off offline and all of these different things. And still thinking that a tool is gonna solve the problem or solve the issue of how humans communicate with each other. Um, it, yeah, just never ceases to amaze me that that, that that striving for that codification or that perfect thing that's gonna make it's gonna sound a little mean like like out loud meaning making obsolete because it's all right there in front of us um i think is a pattern in the world that we um still fall fall into i know i do as well yeah it's the patterns so so we're talking about so far in this conversation when there's um, a thing we realize that we do often and we want to codify it. And so oftentimes someone from the outside, a new joiner or something is, is the sort of the litmus test for this because they they unearth all of those stones where we th where, where things were implicit and we just thought they were. I, I think there's a whole other category of things, which is the the chance to help a group of people this is what I love to do. I love it, love it, love it. A chance to help a group of people see the patterns that they're working in that are all completely implicit. And most of the time, um, the assumption is it's not changeable. 
This is just the way people are. Um, and, uh, and, and people don't even think about the fact that they could think about the pattern. So like, so let me just be really concrete here. So, so just imagine you have a group of people who are talking to one another and they're talking about a topic. So they're solving some problem together or they're trying to understand something. And, um, and you keep noticing that two people talk a lot. And then a lot of people talk infrequently and some people don't talk at all. And um, that's not necessarily bad in itself. In fact, it might not be bad at all. Um, but right now the group is sort of a victim to that pattern. Um, and, and by saying something about it, you can have them, again, the subject to object move, you can have them take something they were subject to and create it as an object they can hold in front of them and say, do we wanna be like this? And so what it would sound like if I were intervening in a group like that is, hey, as you've all been interacting, I really notice something that happens. What I notice is that part of the system is quite um, active and talks a lot, uh, gives a lot of ideas and actions and ways forward, a lot of solutions. Another part of your system is quite quiet and some people pipe up here and there. So how does this pattern work for you? Was like the, that's like the classic first question you ask, because obviously this pattern works for people because they're in it. There's something good here. Like what you were saying, Fran, it's not like, oh, maybe it was Susan a moment ago. It's like, it doesn't necessarily mean that what's going on is wrong or bad, right? Um, and that, that sort of stumps people. I mean, because initially I think people don't even know that they can interrogate their patterns this way. But then once, once you help them start to talk about what's good about it, then invariably the drawback comes up. And when the yeah, and in a way that up, connects with what I was yeah, saying at the beginning about change, right? So if you're wanting to create change or even potentially do that, you're, maybe you want to keep everything as it is, but basically you need to look at the pattern. And the moment you do that, you like the space of agency sort of opens up where suddenly, right, you have a choice and you can say, let's keep doing it like this or let's do it differently. And so I think like, I mean, in a way it's the same as just a regular adult development or personal change, right? It's like you, you try to work on your patterns, you identify what they are. And then at some point you like get a bit of wiggle room to start being able to maybe make different choices and not just repeat sort of the, yeah. the autopilot. Absolutely. It's like when you shine a light on something and bring it into the light, oh, that's what it is. It gives you a choice. Do I want this or do I not, not want this? Do I want to exactly. transform this? Do I want to keep it? What do I want to do yeah. with this? Do I want to keep looking at it? Do I want to put it back? It's 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 all connected, right? It's all connected with our learned behavior, my learned behavior to not take the time to actually name what's happening. Yeah. And once, once you do, like you said, Fran, it like opens up this space of like, oh, wow, really? That's what's happening? Oh, cool. All right. Do we want to keep doing that? We're going to do something else. And what I want to underline that Fran said is it opens up the space of agency once that happens, Susan. So like you've just outlined this beautiful process. And I think a lot of times people are just feeling like the situation they're in can't change. People tell me all the time. You know, my team members are who they are. You know, I mean, these are just interpersonal problems. Everyone's got them. Like, they're, it's, you know, it's, it can't change. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it, like, it can all change. <laughs> like, every little bit of it, every little bit of it, if you want to. Um, but I think that's the important point, point too. I, I noticed our energy has really come up in the last, you know, like uh, 30 or 40 seconds of this conversation. Susan, you're really delighted by something Fran said earlier. And then I'm like so delighted talking about this now. Um, so, okay, I guess I just did it, which was naming a pattern. So I just named it the meta level of what we're doing in the conversation. And because I got so interested in that, I lost the content. So someone else pick up content. Yeah, I had a thought and then it just choop, <laughs> disappeared again. Yeah. Mm. It's fine to sit here and wait for it to come to. Yeah, I mean, I think I, what was uh, another kind of back loop that was running for me during much of this conversation so far is how the added level of explicitness that can come 
through not just looking at data or flat two-dimensional words on a page, but conversation. It doesn't even need to be conversation. What we're starting to do a lot in many of the projects is leave voice notes um, because it can, I find that when I'm transmitting data through my lens, you automatically get that nuance for me and knowing that it's only you know from my lens and my my personal observation bringing in all of my experience and all of my uh, opinions about um, a certain set of data for example and by doing that then inviting others to engage in it in that same way uh, because a, a pattern that I see a lot is when we start to rely on data and data is absolutely important objective data can be incredibly important in decision making and strategy session and deciding just setting and deciding the next moves but i've had many experiences where um i've been in you know room rooms with executives and and board members where they're looking at the same set of data and they're not taking the time to actually cohere on what this means i can remember remember gig I had a couple of years ago where it was um, uh, two foundations coming together. And so I literally had the two CEOs and the two chair people of the board in a process that I thought would take a couple of hours that ended up taking three days because they were literally looking at the same documentation, the same reports and drawing different conclusions from, from that data. And it's, it's, there's something in the way that we have been trained to work that the numbers don't lie. Okay, well, maybe the numbers don't lie, but the interpretation of the numbers is subject to interpretation. <laughs> and taking the time to make the meaning explicit, I, I tell you what, it could save so much heartache, so much time and energy and, and trouble. So many times I've been in um, like, annual planning sessions where we're taking the same sets of numbers, the various bits of the organization go away and draw, draw up their strategic plans and their OKRs and their KPIs for how they're going to achieve their part or their responsibility in that and be prioritizing completely different things. Um, but yeah. just following the data. So I yeah. think that's a, another real pattern um, uh, commonplace uh, oversight that I think many of us make is that the data, data, the data is the only thing that tells the truth. Yeah, and it seems like it might be interesting for some listeners uh, to, to like know about this uh, liberating structure. So liberating structure is being sort of a really great toolbox of different facilitation techniques and group processes, I guess. I don't know if that's the, the best definition. But in any case, there's one called what, so what, now what? Which I feel like is like, a, it's sort of, a, you know, something you can use in all contexts. It's a real Swiss army knife, I find. If like, you can't think of anything else to do, do, so, do what, so what, now what? And it's sort of something you can use as a retro, retrospective format, but also as other things. And basically you have three stages. And the first one is the what, where you basically get all the data into the middle of like what has happened in a certain period of time, let's say, or that could be the numbers that Susan was talking about. Then you have the step of so what. Um, so basically each person uh, trying to make explicit what is the meaning they're making out of the data. And then you only go to the now what, which is like, what do we actually want to do about this? And I really think that... Um, in greater than, you know, we've run this structure so many times with other groups and internally that I really feel like something about it has like infused itself pretty deeply <laughs> into just like how we are and work that sometimes it's like, oh, okay, now we're doing a, a so what, right? That like somehow it feels like something about that structure is so universal that it can like infuse itself into many different aspects without saying like, oh, now we're sitting down and running the process. That's at least my my perception. And like, I've noticed that I feel like it's impacted me quite a lot in yeah. a positive way. I love that. And, you know, Stefan, who's the producer of this show, he's added another thing to it, which I think is really great. Um, just to give like a, like, like a lot of credit, that structure comes from um, Human Systems Dynamics School, Glenda Oyang and other folks. And um, 
So he has what, so what, what if, now what? Ooh, nice, I didn't know about that one. Yeah, <laughs> because you know, we do get sort of stuck in this sort of linear mechanistic thing of like, we move right from some, and maybe not even like a very deep level of meaning making <laughs> or, or sheer coherence of what Susan was saying before we just start to move into the now what's, you know? It terrifies me actually, when you think about executives sitting around making really big decisions and it's not at all clear they're just presuming that they're all working from the same understanding and it's it's not so i think in a lot of cases i think that's why like now of course people can do this themselves but oftentimes i think they need people like us initially to show them that they can ask the dumb questions like we often ask like the dumb question like okay that's a fact what's the point you're trying to make you know, because so people will talk about quote unquote third party facts or data. And, and it's not at all clear to me, at least, what the heck they're trying to say. But no one asks that question of them. They just like go on to the next part of the conversation. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think y'all know what you're talking about. I mean, like you're not in the same conversation. So another thing I was just wondering about, because I guess we haven't, we touched a little bit on handbooks but not that much. And I think that it's useful to differentiate that like when we talk about making things explicit, that can be making something explicit in written, but it doesn't have to be, right? Like it could be verbal, like some of what we've been doing now, like having it in a conversation or that there's many different ways and that it's important to find the right medium <laughs> to make something explicit that, that fits the situation, right? And isn't oversized. And yeah, I don't know if like, if you guys think we should maybe talk a bit more about like, how do we use our handbook and like, how does it relate also to agreements? Just, just very like shortly. Cause I know that we're going to have an episode where we're going to dive much deeper into that, but maybe just to sort of yeah, I, frame it a bit. Yeah, I totally want us to talk about that, but I want yeah. to talk about it. Please if you're talking about, about the, the new joiners thing that happened, Frank, cause I think it's a really good example of something being completely implicit and then moving more toward explicitness explicity i don't know yeah. you know Ex and then yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And, and then we can talk and, about tell them about a little bit about handbooks and like what people's appetites i think yeah, yeah. Susan, I'm and sorry. I, and, no no not at all and um i i think i just i uh, always i always love to name check our good friend alana irving when we start to talk about this because um one of the many things i've learned from her um is if it's not written down, it's not open source. And being that one of the principles of greater than is to continually share what we're learning, make make everything that we're doing totally available to the public as not that you should pick this up and do this exactly as it is, but you should, you please pick it up, um, take what you need, fork it, change it, be inspired by it. And I think that for me, that's like the, at the, you know, that bottom lines everything um, that's important to me when I think about sharing our work and working out loud. And yeah, like you said, Lisa, the, the getting clearer and clearer on the um, explorers process um, is just another example of, you know, evolving purpose. Um, what do we need to do now and now and now and now? So I'd love for you maybe to pick up that thread and tell the story, Fran. Yeah, I can do that. And I think also just before, I just wanted to add onto like that um, quote that you just gave from Alana about uh, it is an open source if it isn't written down. I would go even further, which is like just writing it down isn't enough. Like that doesn't make it accessible, right? Like I've known projects that are like, oh yes, we're documenting everything and great. Here's our repository with every single Zoom call we've done and all of our meeting notes. Like that's not, no one is ever going to look at that. It's not actually something that's digestible. So I think that like truly, if like, if you truly want to be open in a way that people can engage with it and get the value from it, it's quite a lot of work to do that well. And I think Alana is definitely one of those people who's done a lot of great work in making things explicit that we've all benefited from greatly. Um, but yeah, I can talk about this. So we were, we had this specific... I guess, example case in greater than that popped up recently that we thought would maybe be interesting to talk about. And so 
I guess to briefly give the context, we have these three levels of engagement in greater than. And basically in the middle, we have the partners that are basically the, the long-term stewards of the organization. They each have like a representative share. Um, there's the associates that are doing part of their professional activity through greater than. And so they're sort of together with the partners that those are our like main members. And then we have this more loose circle on the outside um, that's now called the explorers that used to be called the ecosystem. And it's evolved quite a lot in the last uh, few months. And so there's a couple different pieces around that, which I guess one is that we sort of launched this explorers concept, I think probably like at least two years ago now, without being very clear on what it is we want to do with it, just knowing like, this is important, like we need to have this porousness to the outer world um, and a way for people to easily come into greater than, find out what we're doing, potentially plug into projects. It's like, I think um, being semi-open is really important to how we, we go about our, our work. And so um, I guess over, over time, over this like last year, especially a lot of things started popping up and it became more clear that somehow this wasn't quite right. Like the concept of what is the ecosystem? What is that role? How do those people get supported? And so we did a whole piece of work um, that I feel like was really ripe. That's the term we often use when it's like something is ready to actually get um, made explicit or uh, evolved or made tangible or decided upon. So that's when basically we agreed a bigger shift to um, e from ecosystem to explorers. And we have something called an agreement or agreements in general. We have a people agreement and that was updated as part of that, which the people agreement is something we don't update very often. So the idea of those is that it's like maybe, maybe once a year there's an update to it, but maybe even less, it might last longer. It depends. But I guess the thing that we wanted to share here then in more detail, that sort of is like a continuation of, of this evolution, let's say, with the explorers is that a few weeks ago, um, we were basically noticing, or I and some others were observing in the system that many, many new explorers were being invited into greater than. And so this is a challenge that I've seen in many different communities also in the past. So I think um, definitely we're able to see the, the pattern more quickly because it was quite familiar. But basically, um, having a lot of new energy coming into the system on a sort of continuous basis, right? So new people that are excited, that want to get involved, that want to connect. And basically, um, the observation, the pattern that we could see was like, uh, the, the members, the associates and the partners are starting to get overwhelmed and basically um, have like not that much energy to engage with all these new people all the time at a continuous basis. And at the same time, many members are wanting to invite people that they uh, want to do work with and that they think are interesting and that, that, that could enrich greater than. So basically, I guess what happened is that I shared an observation with all the members of like, hey guys, um, I'm wondering like, is it just me? Because I was noticing that I was feeling quite overwhelmed <laughs> with all the people coming in. Um, and I think I'd maybe had a few conversations with people where I also had a bit of a sense of like, Ooh, yeah, like people are feeling like it's a lot, but so basically, uh, did the meaning making thing, right? So like we have this data, like, Oh, in the last two months, uh, 15 new explorers were invited. Let's say that's the data. Um, what is the, what is the meaning we're making of that and the, the lived experience we're having from it? And so I shared my own experience and what I was sensing from some conversations with people and being like, hey, do you think this is fine? Or like, is there something that we should maybe change? And so overwhelmingly in this case, and I think it's not that common that something is maybe so ready to just like be evolved because this really was quick. But basically a bunch of people were all like, oh my God, yes, like it's too much. Uh, we need like to have more uh, focused energy on these people when they come and that, yeah, that basically we needed to do something about it. And the funny thing also is that then sort of the, the solution that we wanted to experiment with, it felt like that actually popped up in multiple places, like the same idea popped up at the same time. Um, Cause I had sort of thought about this cohort idea to myself. And then I spoke to someone else who mentioned the idea and then I saw it somewhere else as well. 
So basically from this just came the idea that we create uh, onboarding cohorts so that a few times a year, we basically bring in sort of a wave of explorers and then we can give them sort of focused attention. Um, and so basically, I guess what's, what's maybe important to just sort of fully close this loop is that uh, in this kind of stage, we definitely are, are seeing this as quite experimental. So we're not going to say like, oh, yes, cohorts are the thing. And that means we're going to do that for the next five years. <laughs> but basically, we're, we're going to try this out. And that there's sort of an intention, like the idea is let's do this quarterly, let's say. But um, the thing that we, we put in our, our Lumio decision, so this is the decision-making tool that we use where a proposal was worked on, was that we would basically try two cohorts and see how it goes. And then basically figure out like what is actually the right rhythm for this. And there's probably so many details that are still going to emerge. But so basically we, we worked on a proposal it went on to our decision-making tool and all the members who wanted to uh, pitched into the decision. Uh, there was some feedback that was given, some input that was integrated to improve it and to also like add a bit more detail to the proposal itself. And then we got to something that was safe enough to try, which is basically the, the main decision-making mechanism we use, which is consent. So not trying to have everyone be super happy, but just saying, hey, this is safe enough to go ahead. And so then the last the last step of that um, is to you know operationalize that decision to communicate it, and also in this case we have a section in our handbook about onboarding, and so that section has now been updated with this new process. But I would it's important to say I think that that is not an agreement update, but it's more like an update of a of a guide of how to do the onboarding, and the assumption is it's, it might change quite a lot because it's still very fresh. And so um, we're not ready to say, oh, this is the agreement for how explorers enter the system. But it's like, this is how we're trying it right now. And so I think that's a pretty good template for how think changes often happened in greater than, often over much longer periods of time. But it sort of touches on a lot of different pieces, I think, that we discussed today. So I just want to make it like a, like super explicit what what happened because that's just like do. an amazing story and I think that a lot of people could resonate with that because I think in, in many situations um, people don't stop to do the second step which is all that meaning making people would just maybe even make personal decisions I'm just going to work harder or I guess maybe I'm going to work into the evening or you know that and and not actually address the, the pattern that was going on so okay Step one is that uh, someone notices something um, and probably adjacent to that step or, or part of it is there's some data that arises. We notice there's X number of explorers coming. And, uh, and this is the piece I love, which is now we go look to make meaning of, of what is happening from our lived experience. You know, so checking it with other people. And then from that, we get informed about other possible ways of doing it. From that, we create an experiment and, and, and make explicit a decision to run an experiment. And by the way, get a bunch of input and make it really much better than it started. And then we go so far as to operationalize that decision uh, and update the handbook. And what I love when I go to the handbook is it says, this is an experiment we are running until spring of 2023. And it's like very specific about, you know, what we're going for and, and that it's not, um, that it's not left to, to people's imagination to believe that it's set in stone. Because I think when people see something in writing, writing, they can easily believe that it's etched, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It just seems like Alana is so present in this conversation because with the way you were simplifying the description, Lisa, it, was, it it's just follows exactly Alana's full circle leadership model. So, which starts with sensing, which is the archetype of the, the spider in the middle of the web. like. Fran is a spider in the web and she's sensing, oh, something's happening over there. I'm going to run up and see if it's a real thing, right? Okay, this is the data. There actually is something happening here. But I'm going to inquire next because I'm not sure if I'm the only one. So putting out the little signals to the system like, oh, have you noticed that? What are you thinking? Is, it, is this actually something 
or not. And then getting the confirmation that, yeah, I think this is, could actually be something. And then gathering the people and like envisaging what could be different and then putting up something to prototype, evaluating, and we'll, we'll then evaluate the effects of that um, or that the, 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 the potential effects of that before we operationalize it. Then we'll maintain it for a while, we'll optimize it, get it just right. And it'll be, be just right for a day or 10 years. We don't know until <laughs> yeah. the next person in the next slider on the web senses, oh, oh, maybe there's something here. And it's just such a, it's just such a beautiful um, uh, metaphor for the system. And, you know, another thing that Fran and I had been noticing is that because we've got so many more people in the system these days than we did in the, in the, in the early days, that there's a lot more people sensing a lot more stuff in the system mm -hmm. and it's more important than ever to to make it explicit like how can we also get better at um from our little spidey sense like naming things oh are you noticing that or is this and then this gets to the whole thing of signal versus noise right because it might just be nothing like that that would that there might have been the twin twinkle in the in the web but it might have just been the wind right mm -hmm. so super super interesting but by naming it out loud then there was there i feel like fran got that not the, not the validation but yeah the validation that yeah this wasn't just the wind blowing this was actually something mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it just, it seems so important that like what we're really trying to get to is as many people as possible in the system feeling like they can go ahead and do that, right? That they can name it. Because it's obvious that, okay, yes, us as the partners, maybe we feel enough confidence to do that more regularly. But how can we ensure that everyone feels like, yes, that's something I can jump in and do. And I think that's like the the important like capacity building work um, that, that we're really mm -hmm. here to do. Yeah, and maybe that's a nice way to close, right? Like, how can everybody feel like they have, um, you know, not well, not only the invitation, but we are saying explicitly, we would love for everybody in the system to be doing this. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't wait to talk about that because I'm at that cusp right now, you know, as a new associate to the system and starting to feel my agency in the system and feel the 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 human interaction patterns, but also the tools. That are there to support that kind of agency and so um yeah we're excited to talk with you all about some of those things coming up in other episodes we're we're envisioning an a, um, at least one episode on handbooks yeah it seems like that's the topic that many people are always very very interested in in like how it works how you set it up how, how you sort of get started and how it evolves so um yeah, I think we're going to do one on, on those and probably also um, be quite hands on with it. And maybe even uh, it might be a more visual episode. We're still uh, landing on the details, but you can definitely stay posted for that. And I think we also were going to probably have an upcoming episode about sense making, because I think in a way that's a, the other key stream, as Susan was saying, uh, this role of sensing. And so um, sense making as a as a practice is something that's really essential and it's probably going to be interesting to unpack more. So is that us for today? I think so. I think so. This is awesome. Thank you. And thank you for putting up with the flight announcements in the background. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Great chatting. Always feeling very energized after the mm -hmm. conversations. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I hope it's useful for people. I think it is. Yeah. Thanks, let lady. us know. See you soon. <laughs> Thanks all. Bye. Bye.